Hello and welcome back everyone. This is lecture one, uh, focusing on representation of women in the media. As we begin this module and this discussion, and especially as you're watching the film Misrepresentation, I do want you to reflect on your own media consumption. What images, films, books influenced you as a kid? We all have something. And what was the first character or real life person in the media that you looked up to or wanted to be like? Not someone you knew, but somebody that you saw on TV, read in a book, or so forth. And with that then, you know, as you're reflecting, I'd like to think I'd like you to think about what lessons did you learn about not only yourself, but especially in the focus for this lecture on your gender, how you should look or behave. So this whole module is really about reading and looking critically. What I mean by that, it's about looking at media and seeing stuff that we do see, seeing stuff that are that is maybe blatantly obvious, that is incredibly objectifying women, sexually subjective, and so forth. But also looking at things that maybe aren't so apparent, but are doing essentially the same thing. So here I have an ad from Kadu which was about a couple of years ago, where they had little girls. I mean, these are, you know, 9, 8, 10 girls dressed up as women in very sexually suggestive poses. It did cause quite a controversy, but it does also speak to the sexual objectification of girls and women. At the heart of this module is about being critically literate around media. So whatever media you're looking at, whether that's um, books or news articles, to YouTube, to social media, to the films, TVs, and so that you watch. I want you to sort of question uh, a couple of things. One being first, what is the pos social positioning of the author? Because there's always going to be an author, even if it's just a social media posts, I mean, obviously somebody authors that, to news articles, to history books, even if they don't even list an author, there is somebody writing it. And therefore, then if somebody's writing it, they're coming with it with their own views, perspectives, and so forth. Another thing, as you look at any media, again, any media, is who the audience is for. And it might feel like, oh, it's for a mass audience, but at the same time, there's no such thing as a mass audience. Usually mass audience represents those who are in the most privileged position. So a lot of times mass audience becomes shorthand for a lot of times a certain racial category, oftentimes white, to a certain income bracket, middle class or higher, to a certain demographic of people in regards to culture, relationships, and so forth. So it's really important to look at the audience because it does frame how an issue is represented. So whether that's a news article or so forth, there is an audience that this thing is being presented to and directed to. Very important and something that we do a lot in women's studies is about whose voice is being represented in this media piece. Even if it is a piece around women or other marginalized communities, there's also a good thing to sort of look at uh, what voices may be left out. So maybe there's a piece on women. Are women of color uh, included in this conversation? Maybe there's a film about, you know, best female friends. Are women with disabilities being represented? Low income women and so forth, right? Like any sort of media piece, you know, one thing to always be critical is that what voices are being left out of this conversation or this representation. And that then is as a, gets to what voices are being left out, right? Because inevitably there are voices being left out and that is actually a critical area of intervention in regards to addressing some of the silencing as well as stereotypes that are being perpetuated by the media around very marginalized groups of people. When you don't have a platform to advocate or to even represent yourself, you have other people speaking either on your behalf or against you, most times against you, creating a very skewed idea and representation of your life and your reality and your arguments. 
always there's a message, you know, and, and regardless of any type of media that you look at, whether that's advertising to uh, social media and so forth, there's always messages. They could be very direct messages like do this, this is good, or do this, this is bad, etc. There could also be a lot of hidden messages. It's very important then to, you know, look at the meanings that are being either implied or inferred. So even things that you might look at and say, oh, well, it's telling me one thing. There could be other meanings attached to it. So for us, particularly when we're looking at representation of women and the limited representation of women, silence or absence of representation is evidence that if there is a either just like strict numbers alone, a limited representation of women in certain media genres or types or so forth, that is evidence around erasure, around exclusion, and around silencing. Always though, we know that your relationship with media is a very personal one, right? You know, what you watch, what you consume, and so forth impacts you in ways that probably, you know, most of us don't even realize. So it's always good that as you are questioning media to also reflect on your own self and the impact this media has had on you. And with that, then to also think about how you listen or interpret it. So we could be looking at the same sort of advertising that's, you know, and I could come away with something different than you. And that's really important to talk about, well, what is that difference coming from? So as we go forward, it's really important to be critically aware to a lot of things, but particularly we're going to focus on in this module around social norms and rules being reinforced by the media. And what misrepresentation definitely does is look at particularly sexuality and gender, but you can add more to this in regards to race, class, and so forth. Oftentimes it's really subtle. So for example, this Mr. Clean ad, which again is just about is meant to sell this special cleaning brush, but there are some other meanings attached to it, right? This Mother's Day is get back to the job that really matters, which again is a woman cleaning the house. So I think it's a good conversation around gender norms, sexual norms, and so forth. And you know, this is a popular ad. There was no sort of like kerfuffle or any sort of outrage over it. And there's many ads like this, particularly around cleaning that are very gendered. So we see it so often that we don't even think about it. But it does feed into our conceptions and actions around gender, sexuality, race, class, and ability, etc. You know, even to the point that we don't notice it, that means that it's just kind of in the air all the time that we have normalized this instead of questioning well, why would this be a, a message like this, whether that's a Mr. Clean ad or so forth. As we go forward and being critically aware of particularly how representation of women happen and looking at the intersections around gender, race, and sexuality and so forth, we also should just talk about representation in general. So um, in Sweden, they have a rating system that is both uh, similar to the U.S. as well as they have an additional rating system. So like the United States, Sweden has, you know, when you look at films, they have R, G, P, G, and all those are supposed to uh, let particularly parents and audience know, like, you know, is this, what's the appropriate level for this film? So Sweden has that. But in addition, they have a new thing called the Bechdel test. Now, um, the Bechdel test is really interesting because it's very simple, and yet it's a surprising how many films fail this. So here's the Bechdel test. The Bechdel test requires this, that in any film that you see, there needs to be two women. Okay, so that's the first part. If you, you have that, you, you got one part. But then they need to also have not only two women, but these two women must speak to each other, and speak to each other, not about a man. And these are the three things that will get a Bechdel test approved, which is what Sweden has been using to rate its movies, in addition to the RGPG that we use. Now you might think like, wow, that seems really simple, but the truth is, is that so many films fail at this. Because while they might have two women, and while they might even have two women that speak to each other, a lot of times it's about the male character. 
So there are plenty of films that actually fail the Bechdel test. Films that I'm actually surprised, such as like popular children's films to big, huge mega blockbusters. And again, the reason for the Bechdel test is to really question around representation of women. Because while we can talk about the, that, that today more than ever there are more representation of women, it is limited. The fact that many films still fail the Bechdel test by while they might have more than they might have two female characters. A lot of times female characters aren't talking to each other. And even if they did, they're mostly time talking about the male protagonist, thereby limiting women's representation. Because as you know, for the male characters, they're talking to one another. There's usually more than two. And a lot of times they're talking to the, uh, to each other about like the goal or the mission or the situation that they're in. They might be also talking about a female, but a lot of times they have a much more uh, richer breadth of conversation than female characters do. I am happy to say, though, that the Avengers did pass the Bechdel test, so you can enjoy that. One thing that will tie into the next module a lot, but also spoke a lot around in misrepresentation, is the gendered framing of sex and sexuality. So one thing that I want to talk about in this module is around sexual objectification. So... Here's the thing, how we talk about sex and gender or sexuality is gendered. How we regulate sex and sexuality is also gendered. And we'll unpack this more in the next module, I just wanted to tell it here. So, and something that misrepresentation looks at a lot, and we'll go further on in this module, is about how women, and particularly young women, and girls' bodies are, are as well as their sexuality are framed in the context of very much male desire and needs. While these gendered scripts uh, favor men, you know, because if it's just catering to men and what they want, they also do a disservice. And it gets into what we call the sexual objectification of women's bodies. Now, what is sexual objectification? Essentially, it's the process of representing or treating a person like a sex object, one that serves another's pleasure. So when you objectify a woman in many ways, um, you are essentially making her just no longer a person, you know, a person with thoughts, feelings, etc., right? But more just an object to be in the service of someone, usually men. So, the media plays a big part on sexual objectification of women, right? The pressure put on women through ads, television, film, and new media to be sexually attractive and sexually active is very profound. While this is nothing new, research has found that women's representation in popular media has steadily become more and more sexualized over the last 40 years. Here are some examples of sexual objectification. Well, one example is literally just taking pieces of a woman's body in an advertisement, so not representing a full person, but uh, pieces of them, usually in sexually subjective things, right? From the legs crossed, legs open, to cupping hamburgers like breasts, right? And we're about to reveal something you'd really drool over. Two, literally treating women like sexual objects, right? That can be thrown around to being pieces of furniture and so forth. These are all examples of sexual objectification where you are literally divorcing women from personhood and instead making them into pieces to consume, to sell things as well as to objectify. Now, I know that many of you will say, well, we do this to men. And you're right, we do do this to men. But it's very important to say that, one, it happens in a far less degree. And in some ways, it's often sometimes the joke of it, right? Like the advertisement of the salad dressing, right? Yes, it's sexually objectifying the man. Absolutely. At the same time, there's a little bit of a wink and a nod because we know that this is something that doesn't usually happen, that men aren't objectified as much as women, and we can then like make fun of it and enjoy it. Again, both are wrong. You know, objectification is wrong in the sense that it strips people of their personhood. And this is a difference between like finding somebody sexy or sexually attractive to objectifying them in the regards to making them an object, making them divorce of a person and a uh, person with authority 
person with responsibilities and so forth, but literally seeing them as an object to consume. So yes, it happens to men, much less degree, and there's a little bit different sort of connotations with it. So getting into sexual objectification a little bit more, and misrepresentation, we'll talk about this in more detail. At the heart of it, women become sexual objects when their bodies and their sexuality are linked to products that are bought and sold, right? I showed you examples before. Uh, to the point that, um, you know, it's almost divorced from the ad. You just show a woman being sexually objectified. Media activist Jean Kilborn notes that women's bodies are often dismembered into legs, breasts, or thighs, reinforcing the message that women are objects rather than whole human beings. So, right? Yep. Okay. So although women's sexuality is no longer a taboo subject, many researchers question whether or not the blatant sexualization of women's bodies in the media is liberating. Again, this is not about shaming women who want to appear sexy, right? Because that's one, a choice and sort of an empowerment in the sense of like, I'm taking control and like, yeah, I want to be sexy. What we're talking about is about how media then uses women's bodies in objectifying ways. So there's a difference between like wanting to be sexy and being sexy and objectifying. Objectifying removes somebody of their personhood, of their rights, of their humanity. They're literally looking at it as like toys to be used. And sexuality is about, yeah, I'm a person who wants to be sexy, but I'm also still a person. So, you know, the thing is, is about the, this presence of misinformation in media stereotypes is disturbing, given the research that indicates that young people often turn to media for information about sex and sexuality. Uh, in a study in 2003, they reported that two thirds of young people turn to media when they want to learn about sex. The same percentage of kids who ask their mothers for information and advice. And oftentimes this media message is that this one version of female sexuality, that women should be primarily concerned with themselves, with attracting and sexually satisfying men. And you see this a lot in the ads, you know, to the point of like, if you look at any sort of pro popular magazine ads that you see in the checkout lanes, you see a very sexually, sexy, scantily woman, and then hundreds of ads that talk about... <laughs> how to look sexy, how to have sexy moves, how to like, you know, how to make uh, your husband, boyfriend, partner, like mad for you in bed and so forth. So everything that I'm showing you is nothing new. And in fact, there's been a lot of studies around media, particularly magazine ads aimed towards women. Um, so not only about being sex, like, you know, having so many ads that like show a sexy woman next to something about pleasing and sexually satisfying your man, but also a certain body type, right? In regards to thinness. So there is this overrepresentation of thin women in mass media, which reinforces the conclusion that physically attractive and sexually desirable means thin. There's a spend a, a recent study of women's magazine covers reveals that messages about weight loss are often placed next to messages about men and relationships. You can see an, uh, an example of this from Women's Health, which is a magazine aimed towards women's uh, health, right? So drop two sizes and then hot sex life. Another example, Glamour magazine also sort of looks at, again, a sexier body to looking at um, his and her hot list, 12 sexual experiences every man and woman should have. A 2008 study of female leads in gene-rated films found that nearly all were valued primarily for their appearance and were focused primarily on winning the love of a male character. So we all love Disney films, and this is not about destroying your love for these films, but it's also about questioning about the meanings, right? That there are other messages attached to them. Whether that's The Little Mermaid, which is a love story, which a girl literally gives up her voice to be with the man she loves, to uh, Beauty and Beast, where a girl literally gives up her freedom 
and then falls in love with her captor to Cinderella, which is that, you know, she is valued as worthless and so she has this magical moment and then she meets the prince and everything works out. Again, it's not about knocking your love for these films, but it is about like, oh wow, there's this other message there. How does that impact you or little girls in your life? It's something to think about. Of course, there's also much more I would consider sinister levels to this in regards to, as we've been talking about sexual objectification, we've been mostly focusing on women, adult women, but it doesn't stop at adult women and particularly younger women and then girls are also sexually objectified in the media. There's this... Um, not only are women underrepresented in media, as we'll talk about soon, but women are equally misrepresented. There's this hypersexualization of young, of very young girls, most notably in fashion and advertising. Um, the fashion and advertising has been, uh, particularly the, the industry has been the major drive for this trend, commonly presenting 12 and 13 year old girls as if they were women. The most sort of a uh, cursory exa examination of media confirms that young women are being bombarded with images of sexuality, often dominated by stereotypical portrayals of women and girls as powerless, passive victims. And for those of you who are listening to this and be like, yeah, of course I saw these images. What does it matter? Like, I didn't take them. I didn't believe in them. That's fine. But at the same time, you had to see these images. They did play a part in your understanding of the world, even if you reject them. They are still a part of your environment. And it's something to question then. But if we look at other things like social media, we have long understood that movies, magazines, and television um, have been particularly harmful, harmful to young girls' body images by enforcing a very thin, unattainable ideal. Uh, the Center for Disease Control has been tracking the rise in depression and suicide among young people in recent years, and some researchers believe strongly that social media is now involved. It's just a whole new other sort of level of messaging happening. Girls use social media than boys did, and their mental health has been seen to have suffered from it. Girls may be more likely to make comparisons between themselves and others. A study conducted recently found that 53% of 13-year-old American girls are unhappy with their bodies. The number grew up to 78% by the time they reached 17. Another over 80% of 10-year-old American girls are afraid they are fat, and another found over 30% of 10 to 14-year-olds are actively dieting. And the thing is, is that um, with the rise of social media, this has just sort of exacerbated the issue. But what this does is not only create, obviously, some very damaging effects in regards to mental health, but it also limit it also creates a lot of stress in a young girl's life in regards to her, her education and other sort of activities if you have this constantly running in your back of your head that i'm fat that i'm fat that i'm fat or so forth how easy will it be for you to focus on schoolwork focus on class activities focus with being your friends and family if you're constantly worried about your body image and unfortunately this has created a, a huge stress on young women and girls there's also with this, and I hope we can start seeing these links, is around sex and violence. This infant, There's this trend, trend also to infantilize women, portraying them as childlike, innocent, and vulnerable. To the point that they are technically hiring legal age models, so women who are over 18, but dressing them up like they were 15 or less. And you look into the advertisement and there's this whole thing about being vulnerable is often closely linked to a potential victim of violence. Women's consent is not present or seen as negotiable. So there's this other part to it and something that misrepresentation is going to explore more is around the, just the abundance of sexual violence depicted or physical violence depicted uh, against women in the media. So just focusing on sexual violence. Sexual assault is often a major plot device in ads, films, literature, gaming, and television. 
It's pretty much everywhere. And it's nothing new, like the damsel in distress, a classic sort of trope. Um, it's been around forever, but why is she in distress? One, of course, she's being kidnapped, but there's then this threat of that violence is going to happen to her. Not only the violence and the kidnapping, but violence now in the cap captive captivity. And it becomes a major plot point where you have then usually the male protagonist going off to save the young woman who's been captured. But already there is in this plot, whatever this plot is, with the damsel in distress trope, which is everywhere, is sexual violence or physical violence of women. So the plot is centered on an act of violence against a woman. Two, demasculation or feminization of men. You know, that is also part of this. Like, why do we find the 40-year-old version funny? Again, it is a, a film about a man who is 40 years old and still a virgin, but like, why is that actually funny? You know, again, it's not about that you can't enjoy this film, but it is a question about why do we find something like this, like that a man that hasn't had sex yet is funny. And it gets to the masculinity module about like how, you know, this sort of thing of being a joke, like how a nice girl, nice guy is, is seen as funny. And it leads to then, you know, well, what's the flip side of this? That men should always be able to get women at all the time, that women should be always available to men. And if they are not, we will take it by force. So there's already a stream of violence, even in discussions around making fun of guys who are in the friend zone or who are nice guys. Essentially, the demasculization and feminization of men. Of course, on the flip side of this, you have hypermasculinity, where you see countless media uh, as well as advertisements. Uh, focusing on this idea of like if you want to be a real man you're going to have lots and lots and lots and lots of women thrown at you or you can have at your uh, disposal so that also leads to sexual violence as well because again it's this idea that women are always supposed to be available and if not available we can take it by force Two, you know, there are many plots out there where sexual violence against a woman is motivation for revenge, usually motivation for revenge for the male protagonist, not for the women. So uh, for those of you who don't read comics or watch comic book movies, a uh, really popular character, Wolverine, a uh, big part of his story is that his uh, fiance or the woman that he was in love with was sexually assaulted and murdered and then he goes on a path of revenge thereby becoming the character that he is Wolverine so here you have a woman who is brutally killed and raped servicing mostly just the plot for the male protagonist to motivation for reward as misrepresentation is going to show a lot in regards to you know if you want to be successful then you're going to also get all these women and It'll be you know available for you and you don't have to even think about consent or anything like that they are just there for your disposal two motivations to consume right and we sort of talked about it already around ads um, particularly uh, advertisements fashion advertisements have used uh, sexual violence or suggest sexual violence or physical violence against women this Dolce & Gabbana ad still doesn't make any sense. It's not really quite sure what exactly they're trying to sell, but there is a deep meaning around a violence against a woman. To it being, unfortunately, the only female story where there's a lot of amazing, slowly growing female characters, and many of them are sexually or physically assaulted, and much a lot of times in a much more abundance than the male characters. To just gratuitous violence, where it's just like part of the background noise. So uh, a really great feature um, that you can find is Women in Refrigerators, which is this great online media blog, which really sort of unpacks this more. So there's, and why it's called Women in Refrigerators, it, Refrigerators is reference to a Green Lantern comic where part of his story is that his partner, his female partner is murdered and stuffed into a refrigerator which then causes him to become the Green Lantern um, and for this this really awesome blog it's about really sort of attacking this like why is sexual violence physical violence against women like usually sometimes it's the only plot in a story 
or use as a centralized plot for a male story. So sort of questioning this common trope where a woman is brutally murdered in order to progress the male protagonist storyline. Therefore, a woman is just an object to be used. And a term more broadly used to describe a systemic violence against women, particularly in comics, but you can extend it to all different types of media. Of course, you know, we need to talk about masculinity and the media. You know, family, friends, teachers, and commonly leaders all play a role in helping boys to find what it means to be a man, right? But mainstream representation also play a role in reinforcing ideas about what it means to be a real man in our society. So uh, there's this really great uh, report uh, called Boys to Men, Media Messages About Masculinity, which argues that the media's betrayal of men tends to reinforce men's social dominance. The Mass You Live In really talks about this well, but I did want to go over it again. Uh, you know, for example, that when you look at just sort of the mainstream media, the majority of male characters in the media are heterosexual. They are often more associated with the public sphere of work rather than the private sphere. So most of the time, the storylines are focusing on their job outside of the home rather than inside the home, as well as issues and problems related to work are more significant than personal issues. So issues between individuals. Non-white male characters are, are more likely to experience personal problems and are more likely to use physical aggression or violence to solve those problems. Um, and a more recent study around masculinity in the media found that similar patterns in how male characters were portrayed in children's television around the world. Boys are portrayed as tough, powerful, and either as a loner or leader while girls were more often shown as depending upon boys and to lead them and being most interested in romance. So another great book, uh, for if you're interested in this topic, is around media and the make-believe world to boys and girls. And they note that girls generally pick and choose what media content to integrate into their imaginary world, whereas boys, on the other hand, tend to incorporate media content into their own imagination wholesale, meaning that girls will like look at a multiple amount of media images and kind of like pick and choose which ones they want to use, whereas boys, they kind of just take it all in, in the sense of like they watch one cartoon show that is like exactly that's about a boy or a superhero and they then become that superhero, whereas girls will usually kind of take things from other things and kind of create a little bit more of a mosaic. So therefore then what it does is that, you know, by taking it in, assimilating it, these boys then, you know, take the story further and they sort of then start building their identities around these characters. And therefore then, you know, kind of creates it so that, that it becomes a limited view of what they see of themselves and masculinity and so forth. Of course, it's always really important to be intersectional in this analysis. So race and gender always intersect. Many racial stereotypes have gendered meanings and many gendered stereotypes have racist meanings. You can't separate one from the other so easily and it is abundant in media. There are a lot of examples that we could go through. We just don't really have the time and misrepresentation will talk a little bit about them. But, you know, we can see a, a, a strong correlation between racist stereotyping and gender stereotyping, whether that's appropriation, as Carrie Perry a couple of years ago in the MTV Awards, where she dressed in a ensemble of Asian-like um, clothing and pretended that she was a geisha, to Kim Kardashian when she tried to break the internet by replicating a very... Um, very controversial photograph at the time and very still very controversial photograph that that uh, harkens to the sexual objectification as well as violence against black women these are just a couple examples there are so much more when we look at media representation of, of women particularly women of color it's very racist it's very sexist and so forth of course Representation matters, but it's also about how characters are displayed on the screen, but also behind the screen. We can't tackle this issue without also talking about how these images are being produced, meaning that we have to talk about both in front of the camera as well as behind the camera, because that also impacts what we see. Okay, so 
here's the thing. Again, if we want to, if, if any of the sort of conversations we've had around representation in the media, particularly as it relates to women, upset you or you would like to see some change, the thing is, is that change can't happen just in, in regards to what we see or consume, but also has to be like in behind that in regards to the producers, the writers, the directors, the reporters. So just looking at media landscape and just looking at one genre of media landscape, we still see a big, huge problem. So there's this great organization called the Status of Women, and they every year launch this thing called the Status of Women in U.S. Media. And this is just looking at news reports it shows that despite some gains, men still dominate in every part of news, entertainment, and digital media. And just looking at uh, news media, while female students continue to outnumber male students in journalism programs at colleges and universities, even as overall, o overall enrollment has declined, women are still dominant. Yet, even though there are more and more female journalists and so forth being graduated, the landscape is still very male dominated. 69% of news wire bylines are snagged by men, by far the biggest gender gap in news media. 63% of TV primetime news broadcasts feature male anchors and correspondents, and only 37% are women. 60% of online news is written by men, 40% by women. And 59% of print news is written by men, 41% by women. And here's the thing is that if we want to see, like, for example, more media coverage or news coverage of, of, of women or issues that pertain to women, it's very difficult when the landscape, the literally the people who are writing the news are mostly men. So we need to think about representation, be both, you know, in regards to who's writing the news, who's producing the news, who's even delivering the news, because it does make an impact on what news is actually then being produced. We can even look further in regards to just Hollywood in general. So the UCLA College every year gives a diversity report. And while the, the they sort of looked at um, sort of all media being produced, there has been sort of a slightly more, while women make up slightly more than half of the population, they only made up about 32.9% of film leads, 12.6% of film directors, and 12.6% percent of film writers. Only 22.2 percent .2 of broadcast scripters, scripted creators in the 2016-2017 season were women. 22.7 percent of cable scripted and 34.8 percent of digital scripted creators. Meaning that again, women are very much in the majority in this. On the small screen, women represented about 39.7 percent of broadcast scripted leads. 43.1% uh, of cable scripted leads, 42.8% of digital scripted leads, 23% of broadcast reality other leads, 28% of cable reality other leads, and 29% of digital reality or other leads. And if we think about this intersectionality, while people of color remain underrepresented on screen, the report concluded that projects with diverse casts are often the most successful. The highest median global box office re receipts went from with films with 31 to 40 percent minority cast, and in that regards to also particularly women of color. So here you have it, where the market is responding to diversity, meaning that some of the biggest box office films had a diverse cast, yet they still there's still a hesitancy within the industry to one produce more diverse films and also giving opportunities towards women to persons of color to lgbtq individuals to produce and write new content so this just gets to the heart of it that if you want to see change particularly change within the media whether that's film and etc advertisements social media and so forth if you want to see more representation, diverse representation, one thing is to challenge the images that we see that are problematic and asking for better by our own consumption, but also, you know, supporting and enabling people of color, women, uh, LGBTQ persons, and etc., to be able to have the opportunities to write, produce, and massively distribute their work.
because the industry is very much skewed against us. Uh, I have this quote from Caffrey Hardwick, who um, was very, one of her famous films that she directed was the first two Twilight films. And she's also in Misrepresentation. And she talks about that how most of the female directed films, if they got distribution, would have fewer dollars to support the film and play in fewer feature theaters than men. Because the female directed films go to smaller companies, so the gap goes starts widening. So it's not only just giving opportunities for women to produce, but then also having the industry support this by massively distributing it. All of these factors play into the underrepresentation, misrepresentation of women. So again, this is just a quick slice of everything that you're going to be covering in misrepresentation. Please take notes of this. It's going to go through a lot of facts and figures, but it will be very important. And hopefully this lecture will help you in your watching of this film. Okay, have fun.